All right, welcome back, everyone. It's that morning coffee break on the second day of the Rick. It's really hard to uh, come back in, and the sun is shining out there, and the daffodils are in full bloom. But I can promise you a really uh, engaging and uh, fascinating discussion during the next 45 minutes for this special plenary session. A special plenary session entitled Changemakers, Building a Path to Gender Equity. I'm pleased that we've instituted these special plenary sessions in the RIC schedule to highlight cross-cutting issues and special topics. And I'm particularly excited to participate as a panelist in today's discussion. Gender equity is essential for organizations to perform at their highest levels, and nuclear safety agencies are certainly no exception. A diverse workforce enables a broad range of perspectives that contribute to enhanced decision making and problem solving. By not focusing efforts on gender equity, organizations will miss out on valuable viewpoints as well as, let's face it, just a vast pool of talent. Some of you may remember a, a special plenary session at the 2022 RIC, uh, in which former president of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission and all of our good friend Romina Velshi um, discussed the role of women in the nuclear safety community with the NRC's own Brooke Clark. I'm pleased to expand on those discussions today with an esteemed group of panelists from around the world who, share, who will share their personal experiences with gender equity as well as their organization's initiatives that relate to this subject. At the NRC, we've been actively seeking opportunities to eliminate barriers, but, most, but like most organizations, we have a lot more to do. In order to remain focused on this crucial issue, I'm excited to announce uh, Andrea Cook, the Deputy Director for Engineering in our Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, as the, Ender, as the NRC's new gender champion. And in this role, Andrea will provide executive level oversight of the agency's participation in international gender-related activities. She'll also serve as a focal point to advance agency efforts to improve gender equity within the NRC. Andrea brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to this role, and I'm excited to see her make it her own. Andrea is taking over from Brooke Clark, who is now serving as the NRC's general counsel, and I'd like to thank Brooke for all of her efforts as the NRC's gender champion. Brooke, you've been a great asset to the NRC's initiatives in this area, and I know you'll continue to be a strong supporter. Now, Now, as one of Andrea's very first duties <laughs> as the agency's gender champion is to join me up on stage for this plenary session. She's graciously agreed to serve as a moderator so that I can join our panelists. And without further delay, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Hansen, for the introduction. I think I speak for many of us in this room and outside of this room to say thank you for your leadership on gender equity issues. I'm welcoming the role that you've given me as a gender champion of the agency. I'm really looking forward to working with my counterparts across the agency, across the federal government, and with many of the people in this room internationally on gender equity issues. I'm really excited to be part of this panel today. I'm, I wouldn't consider myself to be one of the esteemed panelists, but I'm really looking forward to hearing from our esteemed panelists because they bring such a wealth of knowledge um, to these issues, and I think it's going to be a very engaging session. So for the audience, we're going to hear from our panelists, and we do have some questions for them to answer. Uh, unfortunately, given the time constraints we have for the session this morning, we're not going to be able to take questions and answers from the audience, but it's going to be engaging nonetheless. So without further ado, uh, let me go with introductions. First, we have Ms. Annemiek Bohaus, who's the chair of the Authority for the Nuclear Safety and Radiation Protection in the Netherlands. She's held this position since 2020. Uh, chair Van Bohaus is also the co-chair of the Strategic Working Group of the International Gender Champions Impact Group on Gender Equality in Nuclear Regulatory Agencies. And you know we need an acronym for every long term. So the acronym for that group is IGCIG. She brings just a wealth of experience to this role. I can speak firsthand for that, um, just in the short interactions I've had with her. Um, through her previous work with the United Nations Drug Program and also as a Strategic Policy Advisor to the World Health Organization. Next, we have Ms. Dita Kahomo, who joins us from South Africa, where she serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the National Nuclear Regulator. 
In addition to this role, she's also the chairperson of the South African Council of the Nonproliferation of Weapons of Mass Destruction. She's an executive coach, and she also is the co-chair of the IGCIG. Next on our panel, we have Ms. Maria Del Pilar Lucio Carrasco, who's a commissioner at the Nuclear Safety Council of Spain. In her role as commissioner, she actively works with public and private groups to raise awareness about knowledge on the, in nuclear sector issues. She also um, engages those folks to make sure we're having uh, stakeholder involvement in many of the issues that we are dealing with in the nuclear sector. Next, we have Ms. Jennifer Yule, who's the Vice President of the Nuclear Energy Institute's Technical and Regulatory Services. Uh, before joining uh, NEI, she was the Director of the Reactor Safety Programs at Jensen & Hughes, which is a consulting company for nuclear en energy, where she dealt with advanced reactors, thermal hydraulics, and regulatory affairs. Jennifer also previously served here at the NRC for 23 years in various positions, one of those being the position that I'm currently in as the Deputy Office Director in NRR. She was also the Deputy Office Director in our Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, and she was the Director of our Office of New Reactors. Finally, and really needing no introduction, is our own Chair Hansen, who has held his position since 2021. This was following two decades of experience in both the private and public sectors in nuclear energy. He is also a member of the International Gender Champions Impact Group, and obviously he has spearheaded gender equity initiatives here at the NRC, including appointment of my new role, the Gender Champion. So I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion today. I think you'll find that the panelists have a wealth of broad experience in this issue. So we're looking forward to hearing their perspectives. And on that note, let's move to our first segment, which is kind of a creative segment. And I'm really looking forward to this. So to kick things off, um, we're going to allow you all to hear a little bit more about our panelists' background and provide some context for the discussion. Each of our panelists has agreed to share um, a photo which means something to them in terms of their interest in STEM or gender equity issues and to tell a little story behind um, each of the photos. So I love this creative way to really break down barriers um, and build understanding between the panelists. So without further ado, uh, we're gonna start with Ch Chair Van Bohaus um, sharing her story. Thank you so much and uh, it's really uh, an honor and a privilege to be here on uh, this panel. And before you, you see the picture of the Dutch uh, women's soccer team, and actually in a match uh, with the USA that we lost on the world champions. But that's not <laughs> why it's there. I know you are happy with that. Uh, we were a little less. But I'm so happy to see this group. I grew up in the 60s, uh, and I love to play soccer. So I, on the streets, I played soccer with my brother and other uh, boys and girls. And then uh, when we were six, seven, they all went into the soccer teams, but there were no soccer teams for girls. So after a while, they stopped playing with me because I liked behind. And I was put on ballet class. Well, if you look at me, you see that my physics are a bit more meant to play soccer than ballet. Um, so that was a bit of a mismatch. Well, I choose this picture because I see a lot of similarities. Girls uh, that have not been really uh, geared into STEM functions and then, you know, along the line, we won't get them. So times have changed. We do have women's soccer teams. We do have more and more girls into STEM functions and we do have more women now uh, into, uh, into the nuclear sector. But there's still a lot to be done like there is also a lot to be doing, done on the soccer, uh, still also an equal pace and other things. But to me, this is inspirational to see these, these young women uh, playing soccer. And uh, I hope there will be in the nuclear sector as many of these kind of bright young teens. Thank you so much for sharing that. What what's, uh, comes to my mind when you talk to that story is the potential to miss all of the talents. You know, exactly. For you, it was soccer. For us, it's nuclear energy yep. and STEM, and the importance of really capturing all of that talent, um, especially with the work ahead of us. So yeah. thank you for that. Who knows, I would have been a soccer player. 
could have been. <laughs> and, and so before we move on, I just I would be remiss if I'd say, you know, the United States is looking forward to a rematch but, um, <laughs> during the Olympics. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we should probably move on. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll move on to Ms. Cohomo for her story. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And um, thank you, Chair Hansen, for the invitation to be part of this group. Um, so my story, the picture that you have on the board is, is a stock picture from the internet because I couldn't find the picture of my childhood doctor. So I grew up in, rural, in a rural village in South Africa and the only doctor within a radius of almost 80 kilometers was a man called Dr. Jerry Mamabolo. So he was our family um, doctor. And the, the professionals that I grew up with, in my primary school years, I would see teachers. My mom and my aunt were primary school teachers. I would see nurses, policemen, and Dr. Mamabolo when I was sick. So the visits to his rooms left me fascinated because he always wore his coat, white coat and he had his stethoscope on. And I looked at this man, I said, I want to be like him when I grow up. So in my primary school years, he would ask me what I want to be. And I said to him, I want to be a doctor. In my mind, I thought, so his rooms were like 10 kilometers from my village. And I thought, I am going to be him in my village. So I'm going to be the doctor in my village. So I said to him, I want to be a doctor. And throughout my primary school years, all he did, and Commissioner Caputo, you'll be happy to hear this, because this is a story of inspiration, fascination, and just encouragement. So what he did was he encouraged me to just do well. Because of course, in primary school, you don't pick what you study. So he said to me, do well. And as I went into high school, during the visits to his rooms, he then asked me which school I wanted to go study at when, I'm in high, when, when, I, when I go to high school. And I said, I don't know. This was the later years of the primary school. And he said to me, I need to go to a specific school that was two villages away from where I lived because it was the best school for mathematics, physical science, and uh, biology. So he said, if you want to become a doctor, you have to go to that school. So do well and get into this high school. So I passed my primary school, and what happened? High school, of course I went to Mahawai High School. This is the school that my doctor recommended. Off I went to Mahawai High School. I studied mathematics, physics, biology, all the wonderful things in STEM. And the rest is history. I ended up in university. I studied chemistry. And as fate would have it, I got a sponsorship from the Atomic Energy Corporation uh, to go and complete my university education. And I have worked in the nuclear sector since. Thank you. What an inspiring story about how like, people, individuals can inspire other people. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, let's move on to Commissioner Lucio. Did you want to share your story? Well, first of all, I, I really want to, to be grateful with you for having invited me. I'm very honored to be here uh, to talk about uh, an issue that is quite relevant in my professional life, along my professional life, and I'm still trying to, to approach to this uh, job as a commissioner now. So if you see the picture I've choose, uh, I'll say that once upon a time, those girls, uh, and m most of the women in here were like those girls in the, in the audience. Um, little girls, plenty of curiosity, plenty of uh, interest in, te in technical issues. And now, uh, most of you have has become uh, successful professionals doing the job you dreamed of since you were very young. I feel proud as a, a woman to be surrounded for so many uh, talented women. I honestly feel admired by all of you. But I have to tell you something. 
my message today is not for you. My message is for all the other girls, like these ones, that uh, once in their early life dream about building sophisticated machines, like a reactor, for example, but in their way to get there, they just gave up. Why did it happen? Since I started as, uh, working as a regulator for nuclear safety and radiation protection, many questions like this one have arisen to myself related to the lack of women in STEM, the lack of women in nuclear sector. As a sociologist, I'm very interested in knowing the deepest, deepest roots, roots of social issues. So I have analyzed several hypotheses to reasonably understand why there is an imbalance between men and women in the nuclear field. I've been searching about substantial differences in brain structure between girls and boys on how they approach to maths or physics. But I couldn't find any remarkable reason to explain this gap. So far, nothing to do with biological reasons. Another hypothesis are related with the influence of gender stereotypes in the decision of choosing a STEM career. In here, I found much more studies with clear conclusions. One of the most interesting ones I've read is a report published in Science Journal in 2017 titled Gender Stereotypes About Intellectual Ability Emerge Early and Influence Children's Interest. So I began to pull the thread. The research was done among children aged between six and seven, the age you began to play soccer, uh, to stop play soccer, more or less like the girls you can see at the picture. One of the main findings is that girls are less likely than boys to believe than, that members of their gender are really smart. And at this age, they begin to avoid acti activities that they believe are only for what the children call really smart people. Of course, the report is plain that this self-perception is far away from the real cognitive abilities girls actually have. Another study from SAD school in Spain has shown that girls feel a 50% more stressed than boys when they make math tests. They also manifest a lower confidence in their mathematical abilities. So less than 20% of the girls that are more intelligent have the self-perception that they are really good compared to 40% of the boys who think they are very good. It is important to recall as well that gender bias appears in competitive contexts where generally women feel, feel less interested in. Another paper of 2020 assumes that the stereotypes may influence women's decision to choose STEM studies. It's been demonstrated that in countries with weaker gender stereotypes, such as Northern European countries, there are less differences in the marks in math between girls and boys. So these girls, you can see on the picture, are exactly at the age in which educational policies should intervene to break the barriers that can discourage girls to follow STEM studies. We all can do many things to attract women to the nuclear field. But still, there is a huge work to do in education of fighting against stereotypes that are still rooted in our social mindset. So to conclude my explanation of the picture, I'll say it is on us for these girls to be or not to be sitting among us in the future. That's my great inspiration to keep working on this topic. Very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. The, I think those stereotypes carry through into adulthood and even as we enter into, into STEM fields, so it's really important. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Yule. Did you want to share your story? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate being asked to speak on this panel, and I really uh, resonate with all of the points that have been made here, uh, especially um, uh, with the commissioner and her discussion about early education. 
and getting away from pushing girls into uh, jobs that, or into activities that are more for girls versus boys. And it, it starts very early. Um, now, thankfully, I, when I grew up, my parents uh, didn't really care if, if I was playing with Barbies, and I did, um, or playing with Lincoln Logs or Legos. And in fact, my favorite activities were Lincoln Logs and Legos. And so a picture uh, on the screen is from a recent Bring Your Child to Work Day at NEI. And uh, we asked the children to build a nuclear power plant out of Legos. Um, and this is what they came up with. And I thought it was you know, pretty good, pretty innovative there. Too bad we can't build them as quickly as uh, we can. <laughs> uh, we have a long way to go before we can get there. But, We're ready uh, to license that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> so, uh, but at any rate, um, at NEI, we uh, really have bought into this um, concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion and playing our role in expanding the workforce. Um, so we are trying to work with Legos to generate a nuclear power plant specific Lego kit. Um, so maybe next year we'll be able to display it here at the RIC. Um, but I do think that uh, engaging early with children so that we don't bring perhaps our own uh, unconscious biases uh, to, to them when they're younger. And uh, it prevents perhaps uh, girls from continuing into the, uh, the education uh, necessary for an engineering uh, discipline. And in fact, um, looking back at some studies, so I probably read some of the similar studies just in English, not Spanish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, there was a, a discussion about uh, when women apply for jobs. Uh, it was broad across all different uh, technical areas. And women will only apply uh, to jobs if they are 100% qualified. Now, you compare that to men who will apply to jobs when they're 50% qualified. And again, this was an objective study uh, with no real purpose in mind out of a university. Um, so, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, what is causing this? Why are we selecting ourselves out as a gender? Um, and I do believe that the early interaction with children will make a difference. Um, Hopefully, uh, like I said, we'll see a, a nuclear power plant Lego kit next year. Um, but you know, why do we why do we need this? Why do we need women to go into nuclear? Well, the future of the industry depends on it. Um, the demanding or the demand for energy has never been greater, and specifically, the demand for carbon-free, clean, reliable energy is skyrocketing. If we are going to be growing uh, the role of nuclear power in the world's energy mix, we need to grow our workforce. And we cannot select out 50% of the population. So this is uh, what motivates us. And uh, we have a number of activities underway coordinated with the entire industry who believes in outreach to underrepresented groups and uh, starting with women and other minorities in the engin engineering fields is the best place to start. Thanks. Thanks, I really appreciate that. And it seems like a, maybe a common thread between all the stories is the issue you brought up about unconscious bias. And um, you know, we don't realize sometimes it's implicit, it's not, it's not direct, we just assume things are the way they are without thinking through what the, the implications of that. So I really appreciated that, and I'm looking forward to the nuclear reactor Lego set. Maybe we can gain some safety insights from it here at the NRC, I don't know. Um, maybe that would be innovative. Anyway, so let's move on to uh, Chair Hansen and his story. Okay. Well, thanks, Andrea, and thank all of you for uh, being here on this panel. It's a, it's a real ple pleasure and, and privilege to me to be with you. So um, this picture, uh, I, I actually have no idea when this picture was taken. This is a picture of me and Senator Dianne Feinstein. Um, it could have been any one of dozens of moments. Well, I worked for her for six years in the in the Senate, and she was a, she passed away last year, uh, last fall, and and she was really a remarkable uh, human being. 
in so many ways. She had, of course, as you might expect of a pioneering woman, she had a lot of firsts, right? The first president of the Board of Supervisors for the city of San Francisco, the first mayor of San Francisco, the first woman elected senator in the state of California. Um, and, and as you might imagine, also faced obstacles, right? There was an attempted bombing at her house in 1976 in San Francisco, uh, among other um, significant obstacles. But it was really her um, courage that I admired the most. Um, she took uh, a number of um, principled and I think courageous stances on a number of really tough issues. And whether that was when she was mayor of San Francisco during the AIDS crisis in the 80s, or right up until her time in the Senate in 2014 with the, um, with the torture report, the CIA uh, torture report at that time, which was when I just started to work for her. And I, I guess I wanted to display this, this picture because um, with all of that accomplishment, and she was a strong advocate uh, for women. If you were in the room with her, uh, she gravitated towards the women in the room. I was in this meeting once where um, there happened to be uh, 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 a member of the armed forces uh, sitting along the back wall, and of course she was surrounded by all the brass, and they were all men, and that was she was not interested, right? It was the it was the woman sitting against the wall, and she said, "Well, what's your story?" Well, I'm a I'm a B-21 bomber pilot. Oh, you know, and that was a whole um, uh, separate separate conversation. But for me, as much as she was a role model for women, I think she should also be seen as a role model for men. She should be a role model for everyone because that notion of role models isn't a gendered concept, right? And the things that, that she did and the issues that she took on, really tough, um, thorny issues of direct relevance to society. And she always had this, she had this litmus test for us that was always, well, how does, when we would go to her and talk about what it was we were doing and the, um, uh, among all of the other tough questions that she asked us, and, and she didn't take anything uh, um, uh, for granted. There was no, uh, <laughs> um, you know, th there was, you did not walk in there with any of that regular assurance of a, of a you know, that, that is often uh, so typical of, of, uh, of, of white men, right? Uh, she would have none of it. She could, not least of all, she could smell fear. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but she would always ask us, well, how does this impact the, the single mother in the Central Valley of California? Which was actually a really hard question for me, given that I had a lot of like national security and research and development items in my portfolio that I had to go and talk to her about. But I had to, I had to have an answer to that question because that was, that was the way she, um, that was the way she operated. That was, she wanted to know down at the local level, what were the impacts of the decisions that we were making? And again, that's still a, there's just, for me, there's a lot to admire there and emulate and um, consider when I'm faced with tough choices today. Again, that notion of role model isn't a, it's not a, um, she wasn't a role model just for women. She's a role model for everybody, so. Really appreciate that and um, the idea of a, of a role model and I love what you said about being a role model for men and women and I think mm -hmm. Both men and women can be role models, and I think we'll get to the issue of allyship a little bit later. But that that concept plays into that um, as well. So thank you for thank you all for sharing your stories and giving us a little insight into your background. I think that really sets us up nicely for the really interesting part of this, which is the Q and A session. So I'm looking forward to that um, the next session. Um, so let's move right into Q's and A's. Um, I'm going to start with a question that I think is at the top of everybody in this room's mind. Um, we've talked about it already at the conference over the last couple of days, and that's the issue of workforce recruitment and retention. Um, let me just set this up a little bit. A recent international survey showed that women make up about 25% of the nuclear workforce, with an imbalance between the number of women in scientific and technical positions and other functions. Uh, clearly, this shows that more is needed to encourage more women to enter the nuclear workforce and then remove barriers uh, to their advancement. So the question for our panelists is, what progress have we made in closing this gap? And what more is needed to build a strong pipeline of women entering the nuclear sector? 
Um, so this one, I'm going to start off with Dr. Yule, um, given her role in promoting the use of uh, nuclear energy, and to get her thoughts. Okay. Oh, thank you. And in fact, we think in the United States, uh, the women are making up uh, roughly 20% of the workforce are for uh, nuclear power. Now, uh, as I said, or I alluded to earlier, there are so many great attributes about nuclear power. Pretty much anybody you talk to is going to uh, be interested in some way. Certainly, there's a set of the population that don't trust nuclear power, and I understand that. Uh, but for the majority of people, those that are interested in clean air, they're interested in nuclear power. Those that are interested in uh, carbon reduction uh, and climate change, they have uh, interest in nuclear power. Uh, those that uh, re uh, worry about energy reliability, absolutely, we have the over 90% capacity factor for over the last 20 years. Uh, the list goes on and on. National security uh, depends on energy security, and nuclear plays uh, an important role there as well. No matter who you talk to, they can be brought in to understand the benefits of nuclear power. Uh, so we need to reach out to everyone. Doesn't matter their race, their color, their gender, their age, uh, whether they have disabilities. Uh, we need everybody uh, to join the, or anybody interested in nuclear power to one, uh, understand its benefits, and secondly, consider joining the workforce, because as I alluded to before, the expansion that we are expecting across the world is significant. At NEI, we developed a uh, work, strategic workforce uh, plan that NRC has had in the past. This is a little different. It focuses on uh, awareness to the public about, about nuclear energy, about um, the uh, great jobs that the, that the industry can provide, um, and it also in, starts engaging with some of the underrepresented uh, groups, the pipelines that we need to build. It also looks at training qualifications because people in this age, they don't want to take three years to be qualified uh, to do a job. They want it after they graduate from college or a trade school, they want to be qualified quickly. And we can do that now with the innovations that have been made in training qualification. Um, so all of this is going to help us in the future. I can see change already. Uh, in fact, when we look at the statistics in the United States, those that are recently hired, women are about 30%, but we need to do more obviously. Um, so the entire industry is behind the activities in this uh, strategic uh, workforce uh, development activities, and it all depends on reaching out to people early in their, in their education, and it coordinates with ANS activities, um, with the Center for um, Energy Workforce Diversity as part of the um, Edison Electric Institute. Um, we're making connections, reinvigorating connections with the Navy and the military. Um, again, uh, it's a cross-the-board approach to attract more people to nuclear power, and it's absolutely vital to reach out to those underrepresented groups. Thanks for those insights. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, um, building on this discussion a little bit. Another commonly identified barrier to recruitment and retention, which we just talked about, is a perception that work in the nuclear sector is incompatible with family life. We all just lived through COVID. Um, we know that that has increased the, work, the use of telework in many agencies, that, which does help to provide some flexibilities. Um, the question, though, is what do you all think is needed um, to more support balance between work and personal responsibilities? And do you see any barriers that remote work has actually created for women in the nuclear sector? Um, so for this one, I'm going to start off with uh, Ms. Cajomo. Well, Andrea, th thanks for, for that question. Um, what I think we need to do in order to, to support the balance between work and personal responsibilities, um, I think it starts off with the organizational policies that we put in place. 
but importantly, it is the involvement of staff members in the creation of these policies because they are the ones that are actually affected. And so it is critical that when we develop organizational policies that seek to support staff, that they are directly involved in the creation of these policies. And um, in the process, we need to clearly outline the expectations. Because if I am going to work remotely, I need to, I need to know what the employer actually expects or the employer needs to be clear about what they expect from me in terms of uh, productivity, delivery, reporting, and importantly, presence at the office. Because what I think contributes to the, or the barrier that I have seen for progression of women since, um, you know, since we've had COVID and we've had uh, remote working policies in place is that there is now really limited um, personal interaction in person. It's all good and well to jump onto teams because we want to quickly discuss something. What usually happens is that we go straight to the heart of the technical issue that we need to discuss so that shortly thereafter everybody can back, get back to their desk. And we don't catch up on life, on the things that are going on with, with our staff. So I find that remote work has presented that barrier of we don't get to socially interact, and this, I think, has an impact on morale of the people. And when you have new staff members that are joining the organization, they actually cannot quite catch the essence of this organization from the people because everybody is working from home. I cannot get this through the computer screen, really. You need live interactions with people so that you can develop that sense of connectedness to the people that you're working with and therefore to the organization that you are working for. And so what we have done in our organization is there is an expectation that even if you are working remotely, that you have to be present in the office building for certain activities. One, you have a predetermined interval by which you should come into the office. It can be every two weeks, it can be once a month, but it is there and you will show up. Then there are certain activities that you must show up for. There are some team meetings where teams meet in person just to maintain that sense of connectedness. And then sometimes you have, our exco meetings are always in person. So there are certain activities that we've just determined that let's get together when we have to do these. And then others is we have started some, you know, coffees with the CEO. So, Twice a month, I host several staff members. It's a group of about between eight and 10. Bigger than that, you cannot have one conversation. So we have coffees and we just sit, we catch up. Last month, I got to meet a staff member that joined the organization in January. And had it not been for that little gathering, it would have possibly taken me a year or 18 months to ever have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the staff member because of where she is placed and the work that she does. There's just, there was just no chance of me being able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her. And she joked, she said to me that when the people in the laboratory she works with, they heard that she's going for coffee with the CEO, they ask, who do you know at uh, high levels, <laughs> you just got here. How come you're already going to have coffee with the CEO? But that's just a sense of, you can see that staff members want this interaction. So it is for us to create those opportunities that are going to help them maintain contact, even if they're working remotely, because I think it is definitely a barrier. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think a lot of the challenges you talk through are not specific to women, they also apply um, to men. Um, so that, that's an interesting part of that. And we're having a lot of those same discussions here in the United States, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, so let me turn to Commissioner Lucio. Do you see anything different from a European perspective in terms of workplace flexibilities of where you are and what more is needed and what barriers might be in place? 
Well, um, I'll say that the, um, probably in the, at the nuclear sector there are some uh, there are uh, some barriers that uh, happen in some other uh, sectors too. But uh, I'll say that um, if we are able to to build um, um, a friendly environment for women in in the sector, and it means uh, that is a place where you can develop your uh, your profession. You can uh, you can feel accepted by the whole. Um, you can. Uh, you can uh, get the same opportunities to, I mean, to improve your 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 um, career. This is a safe place uh, that um, most women want to work in, and it's quite difficult to get to that uh, if it, if you are just 25 percent of the of the staff. That's real. Yeah. Because it's not it's nothing that we do on purpose, but the behavior is different uh, when you feel uh, accompanied by other women, and 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 you uh, you feel that uh, your col male colleagues are, uh, trust uh, you, and uh, you feel that you are exactly the same, and it is I, I mean. Uh, most of the people take for granted that uh, question, mostly in, uh, I don't know, some uh, countries in Europe, because we are supposed to be equal, because we have opportunities to go to university to do, but finally it, it doesn't happen. I, what I said at the beginning, it, it's a real thing. Not many women uh, get into STEAM careers because because uh, still there are many stereotypes. And uh, probably families say, OK, let, let out the maths go on with another thing. And inside the job, in, inside the, the, um, the nuclear field, uh, it, it's, it's quite important that women uh, are a reference for other women. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to, um, we have to um, Congrat our our um, female colleagues for having succeed in in their careers. We uh, we have to be role models inside our our um, inside the not only of course regulators but the mostly industry I think, and um, uh, we have to believe in that we as a women because dear colleagues I think that maybe. Sometimes we don't even believe ourselves when uh, when we have to we have to be a model for for other ones. So uh, I think that it could be a point to be self confident and to try to to show to in our uh, job environment uh, all the capacities, all the ability, all the abilities, and all the sensibility to we we have as a woman. Could I just talk about? Uh a sense of belonging, and um, I think that's so important. It's another one of those things that it's, it's implicit, it's not direct, and some of the things we've been talking about in terms of workplace flexibilities and unconscious bias and some of these issues, they all weave into that making people, all the people, inclusive, feel like they are part of an organization and connected, and that's really important. So I'm, I'm going to move on now, um, kind of moving out more to the macro level, stepping back a little bit. Um, we talked about the uh, global momentum toward uh, nuclear energy and the importance of, of building a diverse capacity in that, in that context. Um, I want to ask the panel, if you were to choose one success that you've seen in your agency over the past one to two years to share with the audience, uh, what would that be? And conversely, if there's one, one thing, what's that one thing you feel like we need to do uh, to move forward on gender equity, what would that be, either in your organization or, or more broadly? Mm -hmm. uh, so for this one, I'm, gonna, I'm going to turn to uh, Chair Van Bolhaus. Thank you. Um, that, that one thing in the last two years, uh, I think we had a tremendous opportunity as we need to grow as an organization because of the nuclear ambition. So there's really a growth of 30% more or less. So we really needed to rethink our hiring practices. And of course, it's hiring, retaining, and everything, but I just focus on the hiring practice now. 
So what we did is, um, first we had to come a bit out of the shades uh, and, and make our uh, organization more known. So we went on socials and we, you know, to create an image of uh, an attractive uh, organization to work for, for everyone. So we invested on that. And then next, we really changed uh, the way we, uh, we improved really our labor market communication, so our vacancies. So we changed the text to make it more inclusive and accessible in language and take out some of the qualifications. We always asked for a lot and we know that women tend to only react when they you know, have uh, everything. So we asked for a bit less in the text to get more people uh, on board. And it's, it's not only, actually not only gender. We really are striving for diversity in a broader sense. So we did that. Uh, and we also, uh, everyone involved in, um, in hiring and in, in being in the interviews, they went to a bias training. And that was really a very important step because uh, we all have biases, and only to be aware of your biases already helps in the job interviews not to, uh, to step in those pitfalls. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone, all the team leaders, everyone had to go through that training. Uh, so we, uh, and we talk about it. We talk about it a lot when we hire and when they're candidates. So uh, those are the things that we did in the hiring, and I must say, we attract more and more, not only women, but uh, more diversity in, in general, uh, which is uh, good, and I'll come to that later. But uh, So this is, this is the part that I'm quite proud of that we made this uh, change. Yeah. I appreciate that. We're having a lot of those same conversations in the United States. Um, let me ask Dr. Yule, from an industry perspective, what, what would be your... Uh, one thing that you think is going well and one thing you think we need to do better? Well, I uh, mentioned our, our workforce strategic plan. Um, we're, we're very proud of that. It was an all industry effort and, and that involves collaboration with numerous groups across the industry. Um, what, I, what I'm most proud about it is uh, the way we went about putting it together. Um, we looked at a lot of data and we uh, are uh, determined some of the contributing factors to why underrepresented groups are, are not coming to nuclear energy uh, to the industry or, or, or maybe are getting there but are leaving early. Just to give an example, uh, of course, a lot of uh, young uh, people are interested in carbon reduction. Um, and wanting to make the world a better place. And they are coming to the nuclear industry. Uh, they're trained and, and qualified over you know, a probably longer period of time than they thought was necessary. Uh, but then they're not staying. Uh, part of the reason why they're not staying uh, is that the innovation, the rate of innovation across the industry is not as high as they would like to see it. I can point to the use of digital instrumentation and control. If you go into control rooms, at least in the United States, you know, most of those operating plants have older technology. So they see that, that's demotivating. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to achieve is to understand the root cause or contributing factor to some of the uh, lack of diversity in the workforce and address it. So as a result, we've got cause and effect. Uh, so we're really pushing innovation. Now, is that going to help? Well, I think so. We are seeing more people coming to the industry um, to work in areas of the use of artificial intelligence, neural networks, uh, the use of drones, remote sensing, uh, digital INC. So, um, we are seeing a change personally at the many working groups and advisory committees that we have at uh, the Nuclear Energy Institute. 
I am seeing a much more diverse crowd. When I first got to NEI, um, there were no female CNOs, chief nuclear officers. N now we have three. Is it enough? Absolutely not, but we are making progress. Um, at the uh, working group level, which is more mid-career, I was at a meeting, it was about 40% women. So. And the, the age group is, is, is declining, or so the average age is declining. We're seeing more young people. So as we focus on the root causes of the lack of diversity, I think that's the best way forward to fix things so that we can attract, train, and retain uh, people from all walks of life. Great, right, thanks for sharing that from the industry perspective. And then let me just ask Chair Hansen, do you see any similarities or differences between what you've heard from a European regulator, or US industry perspective, and where we are at the NRC? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. I mean, I, I, I really liked a couple of things. One was drilling in on the root causes, right? And, and, and I love it, it's really a nuclear industry concept, right? Yeah. Contributing factors. Very nuclear. <laughs> <laughs> but the other part of it, too, was was uh, Chair Von Bullhouse's um, uh, comments about having a questioning attitude, about questioning ourselves, right, which is kind of a foundation of nuclear safety culture as well and a, a, as a nuclear concept, right? These are things, this is a vocabulary that, that we already present, possess. I think one example, and, and we're, we're working to build on this and others that the NRC has done, is in our senior executive kind of training program, really, that speaks to the pipeline of future leaders of the agency, one of the things we did a few years ago was in the initial application stage, we, ha we scrubbed all of the applications of identifying personal information mm -hmm. and just looked at the content itself because we had seen a situation where a lot of the cohorts of those development programs were, there were a lot of similarities of the members of that. And how did we, how could we, again, attack the root cause of that problem and increase diversity? And this ended up being actually a very straightforward way of doing that. And we've seen an increase. I completely echoed uh, Dr. Yule's point, which was we've made progress. We still have, we still have a ways to go. But we've seen significant progress in, in, in the diversity at all level, but particularly uh, um, the, the gender div diversity of that development program. Thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna move on to, I think we have two, time for two more questions. Um, so I'm gonna move on to our second to last question here. Um, in late 2020, the International Gender Champions Impact Group was formed as a separate but complementary gender equality group from the IAEA and NEA efforts. Um, so I'm going to ask the co-chairs who we happen to have in this uh, panel, Ms. Uh, Van Bolhouse and Ms. Cahomo, uh, what are your goals for achieving the results with the IGC IG, and how do they complement the work of IEA and NEA? Let me start with Chair Van Bolhouse. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, I think it's important to note that uh, it's not separate. Uh, because actually we have three co-chairs, uh, and, and the third co-chair is DG Grossi. So there is this, this constant link with the IAEA, and um, we are also linking with the uh, NEA. So the group that started there, and uh, so, so there, there is, and, and I think it's, it's really important that we join forces and that we don't do separate things, uh, because that would really be a pity and reinforce each other. So I think that's, that's, uh, that, that's the first uh, thing. And um, maybe uh, to, to explain a bit what we want to do with the, with the group, uh, and it's still in draft because we are there, but I think we work on, on several levels and we have some, some goals. Uh, one is within the group, and that's something I would like to say because it's, to me that's very important. The group itself, uh, that we make sure that there will be the, 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 the chairs, the, the highest people in the organization and not the highest woman in the organization because often uh, gender issues are being seen as something that is mainly for women, so you need women to do it. And so um, one is the group 
And then the second thing is that everyone who is in the group, they, uh, they, they actually say, well, we are going to work within our organization to improve the, the situation in the organization. So that's the second layer. Then the third layer is that you have to get involved in your own country to see what you can do in the sector to integrate that. And then we also said we will be active in our regions to reach out, be ambassadors in our region. Uh, to, to reach out and make sure that you're in panels and do things. Uh, and then the, the last layer that we want to be active is also, and that's something that DG Grossi also asked, to reach out to other international organizations uh, that have STEM uh, positions like uh, the Meteorological Institute and see how we can link with uh, the, the, the gender uh, groups there or to initiate. So those are more or less the, the different levels that we're working uh, on or we want to start working on. And then of course, uh, the main issue is to really go for uh, as much gender equality as possible and, and exchange our experiences and, and monitor what is going on. But I think uh, maybe you can add something to that, uh, Dede. Yes, I can, I can add. I think that there is recognition in the group that um, at an organizational level, much of what we do is guided by national um, legislation and even the definition of these terms that uh, in many ways we are guided by what, what happens in our individual countries. But what we are trying to do at a group level is you know, to share experiences and inspire other members of the group to learn from how those that have um, uh, progressed much further on this issue, how they have done it, what is it that I can learn from my US colleagues, what is it that I can learn from my Dutch colleagues, but also what is it that I can bring. And so we are trying to create um, mechanisms of sharing this information, reporting templates that can be used to, for instance, share what are the, the, the our, 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 niche, our, our organizational positions, our policy statements as it relates to gender equality. So if I'm a regulator that doesn't have that in place, I can already begin to get ideas of how others have done it. And, and so as a group, we hope that we will um, get inspiration from those that are leading in this field and also inspire other um, regulators that have not yet joined us to join um, the impact group, of course, and uh, that uh, we, we tackle this um, really challenging issue together. Yeah, can Which, I just add a little thing to that again? That's, uh, as we said, we started with not being in isolation. It's, it's very important to see where we can uh, put the, the issue of gender into different contexts as well. Mm -hmm. So actually this afternoon there is uh, a panel on uh, safety culture and there is such a strong link between having a good gender balance and safety culture. So I'll be in that panel and then make the link again to gender. So I think it's important that we don't treat gender equality, equity as a separate issue uh, but try to link it mm. to other things and, and, and therefore um, see it's, it's not only about uh, that we need more women, you need a different kind of workforce which will improve nuclear safety. So, Totally agree and I'll be at that panel session this afternoon. I know we only have a little over a minute left, but I did want to touch on one last um, question. And Chair Van Bolhaus, you already touched on this, and this is the importance of, of allyship and your comment that, that gender equity is not just a, a women's issue. So I, I want to turn the last question over to Chair Hansen. Um, I think there's a recognition that many men do have a genuine desire uh, to move us forward in this area, but they're uncertain about how to engage um, given that dynamic, what, what would you leave us with at the end of this panel session in terms of how men can become allies for this cause? Uh, thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, let me, I, I love this point about the importance of gender equity to nuclear safety uh, culture. I, I, think it's, I think it's absolutely integral. And I also link it to uh, risk informing. 
right? Because as we think about how to risk inform our processes, mm -hmm. how to interpret data, risk acceptance, all of these things are going to require really diverse perspectives. And to incorporate all of those, I think it's, and, and in order to see real change, I think men have to be, um, need to, to show support and they need to get actively engaged uh, in this stuff. And, and that's certainly why I'm here. And, um, uh, you know, and, and by way of example also to, to say um, wherever they can, yeah, what she said, right? What Anamique what Anamik said, what Dita said, what Pilar said, what Jennifer said. Um, because the, the amount of, of wisdom and perspective and um, just sheer brain power on, <laughs> on this stage is substantial. And to Jennifer's earlier point, the challenges in front of us are too great. Uh, to leave um, half of the, the talent uh, on the sidelines. Um, I'm grateful at the NRC that this isn't just a priority for me, it's a priority for other commissioners, Commissioner Caputo, Commissioner Wright, and others, Commissioner Kroll. Um, and it's, uh, it's great to be uh, part of a team that, that cares so much about this issue. Okay, well, I'm not sure I could top that. We are out of time, so I'm going to close out the session um, and just say thank you uh, sincerely to all of our panelists. This was a very rich discussion. I think the experience is shared. They're, they're common across the sector, whether you're in the industry or you're a regulator, United States, Europe. Um, we share common issues, and, and I'll just uh, finish up where Dr. Yule started, which is when we heard from Commissioner Kroll this morning that we're at a, a now or never moment with regard to moving forward on nuclear energy, and, and I think this issue is part of that now or never moment, and so I'll just leave you with that thought as we close out. I don't want to stand before everybody in lunch, so hope you enjoyed the session, and thank you very much for attending.